Hello, and welcome to this special edition of the Cinetopia podcast. This episode is a collaboration brought to you by Take One Magazine. My name is Jim Ross, Managing Editor of Take One Magazine, and a regular member of the Cinetopia podcast crew. However, to help me round up some of the films at the 2019 Edinburgh International Film Festival, I was joined by some of the other writers from Take One. We'll be back with our regular show in July with our regular crew, but on this occasion I was joined by Serena Scatini, Mark Nelson, Chris Dobson, Amber Heath and Joshua Reagan. In this episode we'll review the festival's opening film, Boys in the Wood, Beatles-themed romantic comedy Yesterday, Thai drama Manta Ray and the powerful documentary Scheme Birds. We also have a second episode where we cover other films at the festival, but we'll begin this one with Boys in the Wood. Wait a minute. What's this? You, uh, you doing forensics? It's drugs. No. Hmm. That's rabbit poo, though. I know. I knew that. I was just... Double checking. Found this as well. Beetroots. Some sort of agricultural audio book. This is no audio book, Hamish. This is hip hop. Okay, so the opening film of the film festival was Boys in the Wood, which I think is the feature debut of Ninian Doff. So the folks seen it are Chris and Mark of the crowd here. So Chris, I'm going to come to you first. Um, Just tell us a little bit about the film, what the plot is, and then some of your initial thoughts about how you found it. Yeah, I was just reading the blurb of it online, uh, and I can read that out because it kind of sums it up quite well. Set deep in the Scottish Highlands, it's an anarchic cocktail of generational politics, hip-hop loving farmers and hallucinogenic rabbit shites. So it's kind of a lot is going on all at once. Um, It's funny, it's silly, it's quite bizarre. The villain is played by um, Eddie Izzard. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good summary. The the hip-hop loving farmers I'm not so sure about. um, They just turn up. (laughs) <laughs> they do indeed just turn off a bit. So I, I think what I would agree is that it's a completely mental film, quite frankly. Yeah. There's a lot of strange stuff going on, uh, especially the hallucinogenic rabbit mess. That, that was not something I was expecting. So it's clearly going for very off-the-wall humour. Um, it's got a lot of rapid cutting. It's trying to move at an enormous pace. Do you think it works? Did it, did it hit its marks? It's a bit messy, I guess, because it's trying to do so much. Uh, so some of it works, some of it doesn't. For instance, there's the hip-hop tunes of DJ Beatroot, and there's some interesting effects going on. It kind of, it looks stupid, but it's supposed to. So I think the film doesn't take itself seriously. It's just there to entertain, and it succeeds in that, I'd say. I think I'd agree with that. Um, I, I find the effects quite imaginative. I mean, yes, they are completely daft looking um but you know when you're meant to be high on kind of concentrated mushrooms i suppose it's it's meant to look a little bit crazy uh mark what did how did you find it well so i'll say that i didn't laugh more than once or twice and those were both instances which did not involve any of the main characters that's a bit of a problem um they were both bits involving the inept highland police force who are currently on a, a hunt to find a bread thief when terrorism supposedly comes their way in the form of... Um, I forget what the character's name is. I think it's Paul. Who's the... The, the, the which one? It's the... the yeah. Uh, sorry, I'll be know. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Duncan. Oh, Duncan. Okay. Yeah. I showed you how memorable you found the character, yeah, though, yeah, I yeah, suppose. I, I, so. It's funny you say that, because the, um, I, I have to be honest, the, the subplot with the bread thief and the incompetent police was the one bit that didn't really do it for me. Like, when it was, when it was amongst all the, you know, the kids and kind of the anarchy around that and long-running gags that then go through the film, that 
that I really kind of got on board with. The police subplot really kind of left me cold, to be honest with you. I think it could easily have dialed that back a little bit. The rest of it kind of reminded me, and I've, I've seen this be mentioned as the lazy comparison, but I think it's also the most obvious one for a reason, is it, it had a lot of a feeling of Edgar Wright's early films to me. Um, that same quick cutting, the same kind of like, you know, very humorously quickly delivered cutaway gags. Um, Chris, I suppose I'll come, come back to you. How did you find the, the chemistry between like, the main cast, the three boys? Because that's who we spend most of it with, obviously. As, be, as you mentioned, Eddie Izzard plays the villain who's kind of this... He's basically in upper-class twit mode, I, I, I wrote, as this uh, local landowner. But most of the time, it's with the three boys. How did you find their performances? Yeah, I, I guess it's the standard format of three or four boys on this kind of all with quite distinctive characters. So there's the nerdy one, the, um, the cool one, I guess, the, the dumb one, the more cynical one. So the kind of standard character tropes, um, it, it, it was fine. I felt like it was a tamer version of like in-betweeners, that sort of humor. It, it, if anything, it could have been more outrageous, more you know, shocking. It, it felt quite more, more outrageous. <laughs> yeah, because it was it was silly. It was like a daft, but it's kind of it, it was nothing too. Their humour was quite, I guess, because they're a bit younger. They're kind of teens. Um, yeah, it, it's it, the shocking elements were more in um, say the visuals. So it was quite violent at times. But in terms of the actual what they're joking about, it, it was it wasn't too. Yeah, you're right. I, I totally agree with you. And the, the boys are very, are they're very firmly in the archetype, you know, type of mode. You know, the, the various different facets of that. And I think that's maybe why it, it reminds you a little bit of the Inbetweeners because I got a little bit of that as well. Sure, there's, and, uh, sure there's a Duke of Edinburgh moment in the Inbetweeners as well, so that fits in here. Yeah, and the, the characters fit there. Would, could that be why you didn't find that funny, Mark? Like, it's too, it's too obvious perhaps or? no it's just more it was more about the it's more about the chemistry between them i didn't really buy they're not they're not very specific comic performances i really like comic performances that have a lot of detail these are just there and they they're off the screen and then they're gone and also like for all that you say it's an anarchic film it's structurally it's rote as anything because you know that he has this little checklist and you know by the end of it that the checklist is going to be completed mm -hmm. and i just found this a bit dull and yeah the, yeah like yeah, the character development is rather rushed. Uh, it's like, but at one point there's a big betrayal of, of one of the characters by, by his other friends. Um, quite, well, quite major, but it's kind of just forgotten about later on. So I thought the film was going to go darker. I was like, oh, is this going to get twisted like Caliber or something? But it all stays really lighthearted, despite the darker subject matter, you know? Because it's about murder and hunting and like, you know, I like how you say it was really expected to go darker and then immediately mention murder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. It, 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 it's, it's jumping a, about murder. I guess. It's yeah. a very mixed film. It's, it's about these dark subjects and yet it's all kind of like, oh, bread thief and stuff. So as the opening gala film, I think it was a really good choice because it was just fun. People laughed. Yeah, I, I, I think clearly I found it funnier, I think, than the two of you. The, the, the one thing I want to talk about just to finish off on this film, though, and it was, is the one bit where, in terms of what it was trying to go for, I didn't really find all that great. Now, it's, it, it's trying to do a bit of social commentary. Mm -hmm. Now, it is, it is, and it's trying to do it very clearly with the, um, the villain character of Eddie Izzard. I'm wondering what you two thought about how the film handled that, because there's a lot of stuff floating around about it. You know, so the kids that are on the the kids that are on this Duke of Edinburgh expedition, with the exception of of one of them, and this is kind of played for laughs, they're all working class kids. Um, they have been sent on this expedition kind of against their will a little bit. And they find themselves in conflict with this very clearly upper class landowner effectively in the form of Eddie Izzard and then later his uh, I presume wife actually I don't really know what the relationship was between the two of them that's an assumption on my part the Duchess the Duchess indeed they, they, they designate him the Duke 
um, because originally they think it's the Duke of Edinburgh coming after them, basically. But how do you feel it handled that aspect of it? Because I clearly laughed a lot of it, at a lot of it. Chris, you clearly laughed a bit at it. Mark, you clearly laughed hardly anything at it. But the other strand of it is this satirical element. How do you think it did on that bit? I found it, yeah, contrived. It's kind of tacked on. Um, I think that's maybe why Eddie Izzard would like to get involved because it's kind of this topical issue of young versus old in the context of Brexit and all that. I mean, it kind of doesn't mention that, but it, it's obviously there on the periphery. Um, I, I guess, I think it's voiced by Dean towards the end. He sort of does this monologue um, which deliberately gets a bit overblown and goes off on a tangent, but it's just yeah. There's kind of a there's kind of a monologue and a counter monologue as well. Um, so you've got, as you say, Dean, who's kind of the, one of the boys of the group, gives this very impassioned speech about how things have been ruined for his generation. Then it's kind of got a, a counter monologue from Eddie Izzard's character, um, you know, saying you don't know how well you've got it. I I don't think it needed that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to guess that you maybe agree with that, Mark. <laughs> I, I basically stopped thinking about it by that point, but then uh, the moment where Dean delivers that monologue, if you think that there's any, uh, you know, sort of remove from the filmmaker's point of view, then maybe they're just not editorialising, they're just mm -hmm. making characters say what they think. No, he's italicising this as, this is exactly what I think, and isn't this a great indictment of these upper-class villains? And it just struck me as as you said, a bit contrived. Yeah, and I, I would entirely I would entirely agree with that. At that point, I, the, the funny thing is there's certain phrasing in that, the monologue for both Eddie Izzard and uh, the actor who plays Dean, where it doesn't really fit with the situation, really. Like, you know, there's a lot of talk about you've ruined everything. It's like, well, what, what has he ruined? They've been shooting each other for the past hour. There's not really a situation. So I, I think, Mark, you've hit the nail on the head there. With It's, it's fully in Ian Doff's voice coming through there, because he wrote the script as well, of course. There's that moment where, right after he does this monologue, right at the end, there's the sort of reconciliatory moment, and then he says, I might go into politics myself. You go, yeah. well, that would have been interesting to note an hour and a half ago, um, <laughs> which would have, you know, made us know this person a wee bit more. Because, Instead, he's just a bit of a blank. Yeah, I think at the beginning of the film, he's determined to just follow his family and work in a fish factory. And then suddenly he wants to be a politician. And I'm like, cool, but where did that come from? You know? Yeah, it does kind of come out of the blue at the end. Um, so I think th th we'll leave it there for Boys in the Wood, which of course was the opening gala. Uh, I think the most memorable thing about that for me is Chris here informing me that the ice cream was free at that event, uh, and I didn't realise this. <laughs> so that was, uh, that, that was the real gut punch, I think, rather than the quality of the film. I think there's a lot of laughs to be had with it, and the satirical elements maybe not so well handled. But if you like the likes of Edgar Wright, Taika Waititi and things like that, I'd give it a go and see what you think of it. This was my last gig. If it has happened by now, it's like a miracle. Miracles happen. What happened? Oh. Electricity flicked off all over the world. Cheese! <laughs> Yesterday, Ellie bought you a present. All my troubles seem wow. so far away. Now it looks as though they're here to stay. Oh, I believe in yesterday. Oh, when did you write that? I didn't write it. Paul McCartney wrote it. The Beatles. Who? Okay, so the next film we're going to talk about is uh, one of the biggest films at the festival, I think it's fair to say, highest profile, which makes it rather ironic that only two of us here have seen it. Um, so it's myself and Josh have seen this. And it's Yesterday, the new Danny Boyle film, which um, I think got its Scottish premiere at the festival, that, that euphemistic term they use for when something's clearly already screened in London or something. It had its premiere in Goulston, I believe, in East Anglia. Ah, uh, oh, okay, that, may, yeah. that, that makes sense. Well, on, on that note, on that note, it clearly, clearly demand more than the no. Uh, Josh, give us a little bit of a, just a 
a summary of the, a summary of the film because it's quite an interesting concept and basically yeah. the whole film is built around it. So basically the idea about yesterday is that at some point there's an event where all the lights in the world turn out and everything kind of turns off for a little while and then everybody forgets about the Beatles amongst other things as well but mostly about the Beatles is kind of what the, uh, the film focuses about and it follows the story of uh, I can't remember his name uh, there, there it is Jack Malik follows the story of Jack Malik as he uses the Beatles songs to catapult himself to stardom yeah and basically so he goes through that program and we, st we start off we get a little bit of an introduction with him as like a, a struggling musician right so we're we're aware of the fact that he has some musical ability um, you know he's obviously not made a name for himself but fortunately he's able to you know play the instruments required and is a big enough fan of the Beatles to remember most of their stuff but we'll, we'll come to that in a minute um, how did you find the film as a as a comedy right because that's what that's what yeah. it's pitching itself as was it was it funny did you like the characters well, I, were you engaged I thought the humor was very good um, I, I was laughing a lot and I thought that was mainly due, uh, due to the editing. I feel like the editing really complemented the humour by holding just a little bit longer than was necessary, just to allow the joke to have a little bit of time to settle and also just to get the reactions from people, as I think the key to comedy is reaction. If you don't see the reactions on people's faces, it's not comedy because you don't know how to react. It's almost like the movie has to signal you to laugh. Um, and I feel like a lot of the humour was... It wasn't Danny Boyle humour. It wasn't dark, witty humour, but it was kind of sarcastic, it was dry. Uh, and I enjoy that kind of humour myself, and I think a lot of people will. And I think this is from Richard Curtis's uh, screenwriting. Uh, and it, come, it kind of, you get echoes in Love Actually and um, oh, Four Weddings and a Funeral? Yeah, Four Weddings and a Funeral. Um, and I definitely feel like that was the film's biggest strength, was its writing. It's, it's, fun, it, it's funny you, you say that, because I, I agree, I agree. I do think the writing was its biggest strength. I also think it was its biggest weakness. Mm. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll come to the direction in a minute and kind of Danny Boyle's role in this. But I would say, I think it's fair to say that it's very... If you didn't tell anybody who wrote the film and you didn't tell anybody who directed the film, I think it's fair to say that they would be more quick... Uh, or quicker, rather, to say it was a Richard Curtis script I than a Dana Boyle. I film. absolutely agree. Yeah. Now that comes with its pluses and minuses. Um, you know, I think people can be a bit down on Richard Curtis. He's he's written a lot of good stuff, and you you mentioned some of them there. I'd probably go more with Four Weddings and a Funeral than than Love Actually. But he 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 is also kind of has this slightly corny, uh, cheesy humour, which. Is, can be very saccharine. I yeah. think this film largely avoids that. That doesn't mean it, it doesn't have other issues. I, much like you, I really enjoyed the, the humour and we'll, we'll come back to that. I think my main issue with it is really the writing of some of the characters. Um, so the love interest and Jack's initial manager before this incident where everybody forgets the Beatles is played by Lily James. And in my opinion, she is completely wasted. Um, really, you know, she's, she's set up as quite an interesting character to begin with, but then after that, she's really reduced to very little other than just a, a symbol of everything Jack has lost. There's no real development of her character. I find the obstacles that are put in the way of their relationship, I, I, I wouldn't even say contrived, because they don't even bother to contrive anything, quite frankly. I, they, they seem pretty minor to me, because the obvious thing to go with is that they now inhabit completely different worlds, right? Yeah. So it, it's obviously not a spoiler to say that eventually he does make it to kind of superstardom off the back of the Beatles' um, discography. But he doesn't take her along with him for, you know, some reasons initially which are fine, but then they try to revisit this romance, and it's presented as this massive problem that they can't resolve, and I'm looking at it going, yeah, you can. There, there, there's not a problem here, you, you know. And I'm not, I'm not trying to trivialise the the differences that they they come up with, but it doesn't go with this idea of they now inhabit different worlds. It goes a different route, and it kind of makes it almost nonsensical, contrived that part of it. So the strength of the film is very much in the humour, the music, obviously. Like I'm a big Beatles fan, so I mean, who isn't really? But 
the music's good, the humour's good, and most of the performances are good, like what Lily James is given to work with. I think she does quite a good job, I just don't think she gets much. I think she's, especially in a lot of movies like Baby Driver, for instance, she's typecast into the same roles all the time. She always plays the girlfriend. And in a way, it's kind of a bit derogatory because she seems almost like a damsel in distress, somebody that needs rescuing, something to be achieved. And that has been overdone to infinity and it is very annoying. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned Baby Driver, actually, because as I was watching it, I was thinking to myself, this is exactly the same role that she was given. Exactly, there, yeah. Really. Um, I think that what I'll swing back to, because I, I think it's safe to say, I think we both enjoyed this film. Yeah. Um, it does have its issues, like it's not perfect by any means, but one thing I'm going to swing back to is um, the music and the performances associated with it. So the main, uh, the main people in this scenario are obviously uh, Himish Patel, who plays Jack and is performing all the Beatles uh, songs, and then there's also, we, we get a little bit of um, Real life intrigue with Ed Sheeran playing a vision, uh, not a vision, a version of himself. Because obviously Ed Sheeran is from Suffolk, uh, which is where the film is set. It's where Jack, the character, lives. And basically he performs the song In My Life on local television. Ed Sheeran sees this when he's um, sort of like back in his home county and takes Jack under his wing. So after that, there's a lot of kind of stuff around the music production world, which comes through Ed Sheeran, and obviously Jack's performances of the songs as well. How did you find well, those I think, two elements? I think there's an interesting contrast between the two characters, because um, Jack, as a character, is a kind of scruffy boy from East Anglia, much like Ed Sheeran is a scruffy boy from East Anglia. They have kind of parallel storylines and parallel stories to fame. However, seeing Ed Sheeran is a problem because he's obviously Ed Sheeran and although they've ad kind of added to Ed Sheeran he's more than he actually is as a person I'm sure he's quite probably quite dull and not very interesting I mean I'd argue his music's quite dull and not very interesting <laughs> but that's that, that, that's a very subjective take I think um, but obviously they kind of spruced him up a bit and they've actually made him a character of the narrative which I thought was very well done but what annoys me is these constant cameos within TV and film of celebrities. And it works with something like um, The Big Short, which had uh, a couple of celebrities to kind of talk through various difficult ideas about banking, which nobody would have ever got otherwise. Um, and it kind of works in that respect. But then, and I'm gonna use Ed Sheeran as an example again, um, in Game of Thrones, Ed Sheeran is in Game of Thrones and he's in a pretty pivotal moment for Arya's character and it just completely brings you out the scene it just completely ruins it because he shouldn't be in that world it works better in this but it's still a problem I, I mean I would argue it's a, a problem for a different because I the idea of having a a real life musical character uh, or personality rather to, to guide him through that process I kind of get that I think that uh, as a device that that works the, the problem that I have with it, so there, there's one part of it where I agree with you in what you wrote in the, the Take One review, which is it, it leads to a lot of reliance on his music as well, which, you know, I'm, I'm not a massive Ed Sheeran fan, to be honest, but, you know, I, I accept that I'm probably in the minority in that respect um, these days. But that's one part of it, which I think I, I agree with. Where I d disagree is I think you found Ed Sheeran reasonably believable on screen. Yeah. I did not. I found him as wooden as they come. And I do not understand how you could be so wooden playing yourself. Um, so for me, it was actually one of the, the less involving parts of the film. It was one performance where it just didn't work to me. And, you know, I don't want to, I, I don't want to, you know, shit upon Ed Sheeran from a great height here. Because I think, you know, he, he's not an actor in fairness yeah. to him. Um, I think where it did work, and it was quite interesting the way they went about it, was the music. Because obviously, you know, the world has forgotten about the Beatles in this scenario, so the Beatles songs are going to come back through the Jack character, but they're not going to come back exactly the no, same. No, they're not the same songs. How do you think that worked? Um, I, I feel like where, if you're going to this movie expecting a complete rehash of Beatles songs in a kind of musical way, you're going to be disappointed because it does have that unique concept, like you said, with it being remade. It's part of the narrative. 
However, I feel like they settled in the middle with that. They could have done less of that and made them more faithful to the originals, or they could have done more with that and made them completely different to the originals. Um, whereas now, they just sort of settled in the middle, whereas it's kind of like the originals and some lyrics are wrong and, and there's a particular scene where he sings um, Help and it doesn't sound anything like the original for narrative purposes. But I feel like that's going to disappoint a lot of people. It's interesting, because I, I, it worked for me. I quite liked it, and they, they do have a little bit of fun with the concept. Like, I mean, one joke, which is in the trailer, right? So I'm not going to, I don't really consider this a spoiler, is, you know, it gets suggested that Hey Jude, which of course, I mean, it has no context here. They have no idea where the name Jude has come, for, come from. And of course, like in the original writing of the song, it wasn't Jude, it was Jules. It was Julian Lennon, uh, John Lennon's son. But here, it gets suggested that it's changed to Hey Dude. You know, so they do have a little bit of fun with the concept, and I found one thing I found really quite relatable was Jack trying to remember the lyrics of songs because we we all do this. Where we, you know, and like there's all YouTube channels dedicated, you know, misheard lyrics and things, and like a lot of the Beatles songs, they they kept, they're quite intricate lyrics wise. You know, I mean, they didn't have "I Am the Walrus" in the film, for instance, but like something like that. I mean, like you can never remember that on the first time through. So th there's a lot of things which are relatable humor. There's a lot of very dry, sarcastic humor that you reference. I don't think it's perfect. It's got yeah. issues with the script. Um, th how you react to the music, I think, depends on how much reverence you've got for the Beatles. Yeah. Um, I I kind of enjoyed it, but. I kind of enjoy it when you kind of get cover versions of songs anyway, so some are faithful, some are not. Um, so that is going to be out in the UK on June 28th, I believe. Um, so I no doubt that will get a nice, a nice healthy run. Um, I think it's safe to say though, if you are a Richard Curtis fan, you should check this yeah, out. Yeah, definitely. Anyone that loves Richard Curtis will probably love this movie. If you're a Danny Boyle fan, oh, maybe that's another less story. so. Um, you know, this is, I, I don't think you'd put this in the same stables like Train Spotting Shadow. Yeah. Even Slumdog Millionaire actually had if, its had its hard moments, yeah, but this it, doesn't. It's like you said earlier, if you didn't know who directed this, you would not assume it would have been Danny Boyle. Yeah. You would have assumed it would have been another director. Yeah. So I think if you're into Richard Curtis films, uh, you know, it's something very light. There's not a lot of, you know, it's so light it might float away, really, to be perfectly honest. But it's worth checking out if you're into that, I think. Um, Danny Boyle fans may be a bit disappointed. Okay, so the next film we're going to talk about is Manta Ray, uh, which is obviously uh, at the festival after a successful screening at the Venice Film Festival, where it won the Orizonte Award for, I think, Best Film, yeah. you know right So the focus on that are uh, myself, Serena and Mark. So Mark, I'm going to start off with you. Um, just give us, a, again, much as we've done for the other films, a little bit of an intro as to what the film's about and who, who's involved and so forth. Sure, so it's directed by Futafong Arunfeng. I, didn't know, I couldn't see if they had directed anything else. I think it's maybe a first feature. It's a first feature. Is it, like a, it was a cinematographer, I think it still is. Yeah. But yeah, it's the first feature by first him. Feature. Okay, so essentially starts off in like the, this utterly strange fashion, but it's really beguiling, where someone is walking through a, sort of a forest and they're covered in what seem like Christmas lights or kind of... <laughs> There's sparkling lights, and there's this droning, like, no, there's this noise of, like, f you know, haulage, like mm -hmm. something being, like, torn through the wood. Yeah. And this doesn't connect to anything for quite a while, I would say, not until about the last 20 minutes. But it should be noted that anything that, uh, anything that appears in the allegorical material of the film is anchored by the opening inscription, which is for the Rohingya, for the Rohingya yeah. Muslims in mm -hmm. uh, Burma or Myanmar. And... I'll say that it's about a man who is walking through this, we must assume, the same forest, and he comes across a, a soldier lying face down in the mud with a bullet in his chest, and he takes him into his house, helps him recuperate. They eventually become friends, although the soldier is mute. We don't hear him talk at all. The only noise that he makes is a sort of grunt, and in one scene where he's taught to hold his breath before he goes underwater, a kind of low, mm, which he does, again, at a lovely point at the end. But things are complicated by 
uh, an ex-wife who comes back into the picture and the man who found the soldier has a habit in the woods or in the forest where he puts his ear to the ground and you're not quite sure what it is he's, he's doing. He eventually unearths these little gemstones that are buried in the forest floor and he takes these and he would have made them for his wife, his wife no longer being around, decides to polish them off and then throw them into the sea so that they attract the manta ray. What the you know sense of this is, I'm not so sure, but I found it totally arresting. It's interesting. The fact that you're saying that to you, the, uh, the mute character is like a soldier. So uh, it's not the same reading I have of the film. So to me, it's like a refugee too. So basically, it's like drifting on the coastal shore and he's basically rescued. I mean, he's wounded and he's rescued by the main protagonist, like the other fisherman. So, and linking to that, I have like a different reading of everything else, like the lights, the mantra rays and stuff. Uh, for example, the fact that, um, you know, the fisherman says something like that the, uh, the mantra rays are attracted by the, uh, the gem and then you know, in the in the woods, there are these gems that are like glittering, glimmering under the moonlight. And then also some of the soldiers, maybe, I don't know, some human trafficker, we're not sure who they are. They're just going around with like all these Christmas lights, um, wearing like a dress. So um, it could be like a connection between the two, like um, these refugees, yeah, the Rohingya are like the uh, manta rays, both of them attracted to those lights and then in the end the outcome will be their death eventually somehow because of like cruel people, the word and everything else and so yeah I was like struck by the fact that you thought he was a soldier, is there, is there anything yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that I, I suggested thought, you? I thought it was clothing, I thought he was wearing clothing. Nike, but I could be completely wrong about that. Totally. You can buy that at a market or yeah I mean. That's, that's <laughs> I, I think what what this kind of highlights is a little bit about what you get from the film, or the fact that people mm -hmm. can get different things from the film. Now, I, no, I, th I would say my, my reaction was a little bit more like Serena's, but what, what is clear is it's very much based in metaphor, yeah. allegory. It's, it, it, has a, it has a plot of sorts, mm -hmm. um, in that once this, uh, this man is rescued, he's yeah. taken into... Um, He's taken to the home of the original sort of fisherman character who, mm. who finds him. And basically, he kind of nurses him back to health. And, you know, he basically, it's almost like he becomes a sort of father figure to him, almost, in a sense. Like, he's kind of like yeah. showing him how to go back into, into society. The, the sparkling lights thing is a recurring motif throughout. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. the, like, as we've discussed, the, it opened, the film opens with that mm -hmm. in what is kind of a stand-apart scene until later, but it is something which keeps coming back uh, throughout the, the rest of the film. And I think the, the different readings here really just unpack the fact that I think you'll be peeling layers back on this mm -hmm. for quite some time. I think the, the main thing for people to know about it really is, I think it looks stunning. Yep. Yeah, sure. Uh, it had me basically from the opening shot. Mm -hmm. um, so the shot that Mark described of, uh, at that point, that's very clearly a, a, a soldier um, treading through this forest mm -hmm. covered in Christmas lights. Like, it really had me from, from the get-go. And the rest of the film largely lives up to that. I mean, there's some stunning shots. There, there were a couple of bits that didn't work quite so well for me. When he's been taught the breathing exercises, it didn't quite okay. sit right with me to it. I, I really love that, together with a scene like in the um, kind of run down home of the fisherman guy where the, all, the, all the lights and stuff and they're kind of dancing. That's like a bonding, a super connection yeah. between them at the time. And then after that, the, the scene when it's like uh, teaching him how to breathe underwater. Mm -hmm. So it felt like their bonding is kind of turning into an imprinting of sort. Like this guy is kind of an animal and is like learning stuff through the other one. And there's also a stylistic change in those moments yeah. too because when they start dancing it's the first time that it's not um, objective camera work, it goes to a point yeah, of view yeah, shot sure. and then it does that again when they start mm -hmm. uh, the breathing practices. Yes. Um, the thing I, I mentioned briefly to Serena before we saw the film was that I'd seen a lot of reviews of this which had all mentioned, mostly by white critics has to be said, all mentioned Apichat Pong were aesthetical as a comparison 
the substance of the comparison seems to be that the film is based in Thailand and involves a forest. <laughs> it's not seem to be much more than that. Mm -hmm. I thought like the actual, uh, uh, you know, the uh, I think the better, more grounded comparison to be made is with Tsai Ming Liang's films, the Taiwanese daughter. Um, there's a scene in a sort of not quite a bathtub, sort of a um, I don't know how you put it. It's almost like a it's just like a barrel of water where they're bathing, where the ex-wife is bathing with the mute soul, the, the mute, uh, <laughs> the mute character. The mute character. The mute character. Yeah. And they have this moment where she starts singing to him, but they're kind of just together in this pool of water. And it's very much like a short film by Simon Liang called No No Sleep, where two characters are aware that they're both in a sort of hot spring together, but don't know how close they are to each other and don't have a sense of connection with each other. And I felt like that was, if not referenced, it was just, you know, similar in a way. So if, if you were going to speak about, it, like, recommend this film, so I think it's safe to say that I did. So the, all three of us saw this in the press screening at the festival, and I think we would all heartily recommend it. Mm -hmm. What was the standout element for, for you, would you say? Are we talking... Because to me, I don't think the plot is really a standout element. I mean, it, it's a very... I mean, it's almost more of a mood piece, really. I mean, there are clear strands, but I feel like the, the plot, um, if I'm being honest, it basically wouldn't have any real um, trajectory to it if it hadn't had that dedication at the start. Now, I don't want to... I mean, it sounds like a ridiculous thing to say, right? Because it makes the dedication at the start. Yeah, it's well, very I mean, clearly I mean, about... I mean, come on, the plot in the end is quite, it's quite basic somehow. There are these two guys, one is rescued, the, the other is the saviour, and then there's the ex-wife, then suddenly the main guy disappears and the ex-wife appears, and then, yeah. That's it. That's, that's it. it. I mean, pretty much that's the film. Uh, I would not so mention that's, that's going to be the trailer for when the film is released, <laughs> just Serena saying that. <laughs> 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 no, yes, yeah, so come on. I mean, it's not that much in the end. So uh, for me, I guess it's all the uh, like metaphorical and allegorical part of it all, and then also like the cinematography was really yeah. stunning, and all the uh, the lights play, and the fact that it was like a counterpart for the fact that the guy is mute. So it kind of lost the sense, and then it gains like the other one. So if it be sight and all the lights sparkling and shimmering. Yeah. yeah. I would I would say something similar, but I would add that there's a it's just a I don't know what you'd call it. You'd just say it's like an aching, undeniable film sense to the stuff. It doesn't necessarily have immediately legible meaning to me, mm -hmm. but I was not thinking at any point, wow, what vagueness. I was just thinking this is so specific, this is so yeah. detailed, these images are, you know, beautiful. There's a moment mm -hmm. where for some reason, the main character is standing in a derelict high-rise building. There's a couple mm -hmm. of floors mm -hmm. up. Yeah. Yeah. Suddenly, the camera goes behind a pillar, very slowly, yeah. just tracks, and then he's out of the frame. Um, and yeah. I, I just about levitated that, that scene. Not because it has any import, just because, wow, I was, okay, I, I was drawn in by that completely, okay? Well, yeah, I, I'm pleased you mentioned that, because that, that it's a really short moment. It's, it's, it's quite funny that you and I have both both picked up on that because I mean it exists for all of about maybe 10, 15 seconds. Yeah. I think yeah, it's so it a doesn't single have time. an impact on the film like in the end, but it's, it was so powerful and extraordinary. But it, I think it kind of hammers home the fact that th this film is it's very visual. It's very it's very based on the performances as well. I mean they're not necessarily doing a you know classic. Uh, story, but it is very impactful in terms of the way you connect with those characters through imagery, metaphor, and, and all the rest of it. Um, so I think we'll maybe leave it there for Manta Ray. Um, as you can see, it's probably quite a hard film to describe, mm -hmm. but I think we would all heartily recommend it when I would be very surprised if that doesn't get a run in a few uh, art house cinemas around the country. This is Pat. Hey, I'm talking Pat. Yeah, Pat, he's on the first. Who's Pat, bud? Who's Pat, bud? Pat, bud. Pat, bud. Jemma Gillen, Jemma G for the Jai Rice. I don't know what I like, like. I just like them setting them at him. I see that a hit or a miss, it can be quite rough. And as long as I've bushed his lip or broke his nose by the time he goes out, I'm alright, we'd bet. It makes me think, like how my mum could have left me because I could never leave Liam, ever. 
Okay, so the next film is a documentary, the, uh, the first documentary we've looked at, and it is Scheme Birds, uh, which is also been quite successful. It won Best, Docu Best International Documentary at the Tribeca Film Festival. I think it also won an award for its directors at the, the same time. Uh, I could be wrong about that, but the point is it's been quite well regarded, and that's where it premiered. Um, so I've seen it, as has Josh and Amber. So Amber, I'll come to you first on this, just to give us a wee uh, summary of what the film's about and kind of your initial first impressions of it. All right, so the film centers around um, Gemma. Gemma, um, she lives on this uh, scheme in Motherwell in Scotland. Um, and she's very young and she's, you know, just, she doesn't have a mother. She's raised by her grandfather. Uh, she's in a very deprived area and there's a lot of banality to her life. There's a lot of drinking and fighting and you either get knocked up or locked up, as she says at the beginning of the film. Like, there doesn't seem to be any prospects for anyone who lives there. And she even says at the beginning she expects she's going to spend her whole life in this game. And she doesn't want to leave. She says that it's great. Like. Yeah, that, I mean, that's quite a striking moment at the start of the film because um, she says that it, the description of where she lives is quite an intriguing one. So she said the scheme, which of course is kind of the, 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 the what in Scotland is called, what I suppose American people would call project, basically. Yeah. Um, but, you, you know, it's, kind of, it, it's, all, it's mostly council housing and she describes it as a non-snobby place to live, which I found quite, quite striking. Um, and that kind of, that, that current goes through the, the whole of the, the film in terms of like how that's then framed her life and the, the lives of those around them. Um, Josh, what did you make of the film? Well, having kind of no idea about the location or any of the background behind it before, I'm not Scottish, you know, I'm from East Anglia. I have no knowledge of that. However, I do feel like there were some things that I definitely did pick up on some kind of universal truths about uh, people kind of spending a lot of time drinking, smoking, doing drugs, whatever, and uh, how there is basically nothing else to do because there's not many jobs left, mainly because of certain political people in the past. I mean, Thatcher. We Thatcher. can say Thatcher. <laughs> Uh, uh, you, you're, not, you're north of the border now, Josh. You can have a go at Thatcher without getting too worried about it. And, uh, yeah, that, like certain kind of similarities with certain places in kind of north of England. Um, and I feel, though, I'm from the south of England, I can definitely kind of identify with how that works. So I could connect with it on that level. So it, it is quite striking the way that the film sets its stall out. Um, so, I mean, Josh, you, you've alluded to it there. Basically, very early on in the film, Gemma, who is the, I think she's basically very early 20s, I think, when we, we come to her. And most of the film has a, uh, a voiceover from her. And the, some of the first stuff that she says in voiceover is giving a little bit of a history of Jerviston, which is known to the locals called Jervy, which is an area in Motherwell. And it's very clear from the opening scene that it is a very deprived area. There's not really a whole lot to, to do. Um, there's a lot of reference to folk who come to look at her grandfather's, uh, I, I can't remember if it's racing pigeons or homing pigeons, but it's pigeons. Um, I think it's, it's just like the, the make of them. It's like a dog show or a cat show, but for pigeons. Like they're looking at how the colouring is and the plumage. Yeah. They're not looking at their ability to do anything. They're just... Yeah, yeah. And the people who go to it, there's a lot of reference made to, you know, the, you know, some of the guys have been in prison. There's a lot of reference to people doing crazy stuff or having seen crazy stuff. And throughout the film we get that, that voiceover continuing, but at the start it really sets its stall out by making reference to the steelworks, uh, which used to be in Motherwell, and of course, you know, which obviously Motherwell is very famous for, and them being shut down by Thatcher and basically very overtly blaming her for a lot of the decline that followed. Now, you know, without getting into political discussions, I probably have some sympathy with that particular viewpoint, but the point is that it really does set that out uh, very early on. After that, we follow Gemma as she um, basically takes up with a boyfriend, her grandfather, uh, adoptive grandfather, I think, if I remember correctly, um, really doesn't like. Uh, he doesn't. He does seem to be bad news. But it then follows her as she then uh, takes up with him. They have a child together, and it follows her life over the course of a period of time. 
Amber, how did you find that structure? Because obviously it could be a much shorter period of time and a very kind of like static portrait, but we do kind of go on a journey with Jemov. How did you find that? Um, I mean, it's a very traditional sort of narrative for a young girl um, with no prospects. You know, she's probably like a teenager at that point and she's gotten pregnant with her boyfriend and they've got a flat together in uh, one of the tower blocks. Um, it's... I grew up near Dundee, like I grew up in Blake Alley, Perthshire. So Dundee was the pregnancy, teenage pregnancy capital of Europe, I think, at one point. And I, I lo- I'm from Dundee, so I can confirm that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so like it was always like a warning, danger thing, like this could be you, like all those uh, reality television shows. Like it's a very common thing, and uh, it's a almost like no, it's almost normal. Um, for certain, some people, like that's just what happens. That's just what it's like. So I feel like the film, like presents that normality to it. Like these things that would be very shocking or very, um, like terrible to happening to someone else is just her life. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think that that's something which I think it really achieved very well because there are these things which it. it it's a pretty grim portrait. I mean, I, I mean, it really is. I mean, there, there's no opportunities. There's people getting uh, assaulted in the film. Like, in fact, one character. I, I mean, and I th- this is the funny. This tells you a lot about the approach of the film. That I keep talking about characters, right? But we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. But one person we see in the film is basically then assaulted at one point in the film by another person who we've already seen in the film, and you know we see very young kids uh, drinking, uh, we see drug taking. It, it's not a pretty portrait, but what I find remarkable about it is exactly what you said. It, it really gets across the fact that to these kids, and they are kids, it's normal. Uh, I mean, that's how, how they go about their day because there are no opportunities. There's nothing there, really. So I find that quite, quite incredible that they managed to get that across. And it does it with such a level of intimacy on Gemma's life. Um, like I, I think it, given that we have the voiceover from her, I think that really speaks to it. It really allows you to identify with her, which, I mean, okay, yes, I, I grew up in Scotland, but I mean, I've got to be honest, it was quite a middle class upbringing. I didn't, you know, I didn't, I, I knew people in that sort of situation, but I've never experienced it myself. So being able to get uh, people to identify with it. And I think it's obviously done that elsewhere, because if it did that well at Tribeca, then it can obviously get other people to identify with it. I really, I really think that's quite an achievement. And it does that in a variety of ways with the, the shots, the access that um, they had to Gemma and her life. Josh, as the, as the non-Scot, I do have a question for you, though. How much did you understand what was happening? Um, <laughs> and I more mean like the, what, what was actually being said. Well, especially during the moments where it's like a montage of all the history and stuff that was quite clear to understand. I think they did that purposely so then people who couldn't understand then could. Um, and I picked up most of it. A lot of it was through the visual storytelling um, in a way that I didn't really need to understand what they were saying to know what was being said just by their mannerisms, how they act. And it's a testament to um, how well they managed to film it, that, that you can just pick it up without knowing. It was almost, to me, like watching a foreign film in some ways, because like, I could not understand any of it at some points. Yeah, I, I was right, because the, di- the dialogue, I mean, we've got some really, really thick West Coast accents there, and it can be quite, quite hard to decipher. But I think you've hit upon a key thing there, in that it is a very visual film. Um, you know, a lot of documentaries, they can be quite uh, static, it's all kind of talking heads. This really goes for a far more narrative approach. Uh, and something that actually reminded me of, and I'm no expert on documentaries, so I'm sure there are other films which have, have done this, I'm just not aware of them to hand. There was a film which actually was at Tribeca uh, last year, uh, The Island of the Hungry Ghosts, which got a couple of screens in in Edinburgh. And it had this same thing where it went for quite a narrative approach. Um, It had a lot of kind of filler shots which were very beautifully done, were clearly meant to kind of evoke a certain atmosphere. In a way, it's almost like that approach has been taken and used for um, the Scottish schemes, effectively. Now, it's less 
it's less based in, there's no fictional bits. Um, so that film and other films have gone for this kind of hybrid approach where they have fictional elements inserted. That's not happened here, or at least if it did, I certainly didn't pick up on it. But it has that, that same uh, goal of trying to evoke the place and then take you on a journey with the people in it. And I think that's why I keep referring to them as characters, which I feel really bad doing, right? Because these are, these are real people. These people actually, you know, these people exist and they are living their lives. But you really feel like you are on a story with them. And that happens with the visuals. It also happens with the parts that they choose to put a voiceover on. And the visuals, I think, are often quite beautiful in some places. I mean, there's a lot of kind of like, sunset shots and star night shots all lots all of landscapes of lots of shots of just the kind of industrial estates lots of shots of the council houses and i thought it was really well done yeah. lots of birds as well like the metaphor of birds and flying and things like that lots and lots of birds yeah, <laughs> yeah well, well that's the thing I, I think as amber said there it's the, the that the, the birds so the the pigeons there's a tattoo on on Gemma's back that says you know let the free birds fly again that's a metaphor through the whole thing and I think that really is part of what makes the film so impactful. This is not, it's not some cheap Channel 4 documentary where you're meant to, it's not poverty porn, really, is what yeah. I'm trying to get across. It's really presenting the people, and it does that in a really effective way, I think. My worry with that is that um, it might be a bit too much for some people outside, for instance, of Scotland. Hopefully not, because I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I think it should be shown in cinemas all over and it should be, you know, able to be accessed easily. Um, but my worry is that it will not be accessible to a bigger audience, simply because people won't give it the chance to be. So just on that part, I'm wondering if part of the, what I find to be the effectiveness of this, and I think it, it speaks to like hopefully what I think will make it accessible elsewhere. The team behind this are actually largely Swedish. Yes, the two directors are both uh, Ellen Fisk and Eleanor Halland. Uh, at least one of them is a cinematographer and this is her first directorial uh, debut. I think that's very interesting in the film. I think you can definitely see the influence of European and outside um, the UK like interests in the film. Because for one thing, they have a character outright say that the English hate the Scots. The choice of using Loki, the Scottish rapper, as um, music um, in the end credits and at certain points throughout the film, like, that's a very, like, they're very definitely saying this in Scotland rather yeah. than the United Kingdom, and I think that's very um, interesting, as well for Scott and, like, for a European perspective, that maybe is that how they see us. Yeah, yeah, it's good you mentioned music as well because obviously that that's a thread to the whole thing as well. There's a lot of hip hop on the the soundtrack. There, I think there is a certain level of detachment on the director's part in terms of being able to present it objectively, but they're very much presenting it as a a film of Scotland, really. Okay, so I thought we'll leave it there for Scheme Birds. Uh, very good documentary. I have no doubt that that will definitely show up um, around the country at some point. And I think it's definitely one that everybody should check out. Thanks for listening. This episode of the show was produced by me, which is why some of it sounds like it's coming from the bottom of a well, but that's the price we pay for recording on the go. If you want to hear about Bait and Yara, Joanna Hogg's The Souvenir, and romantic comedy Love Type D, then tune in to the other special episode for the Edinburgh International Film Festival. Thanks for listening, and if you want to read more, go to Cinetopia Hub or Take One Cinema on Twitter, or you can visit the website at cinetopiashow.com or takeonecinema.net. See you there.